So despite uh, the uh, 80 to 90 percent of patients with ALL achieve a hematological complete remission after induction therapy, still a substantial number of patients uh, continue to exhibit uh, minimal residual or measurable residual disease uh, positivity, which I will refer to as MRD in this uh, presentation. In fact, up to 50% of adults with ALL uh, will have uh, MRD positivity at end of induction, and up to 20% of pediatric ALL in CR will have uh, MRD positivity uh, at end of induction. And from multiple studies uh, up to date, uh, we know now that MRD strongly predicts overall survival and event-free survival in both pediatrics as shown in the top figures and adults as shown in the uh, bottom figures. Uh, and is, uh, MRD is the strongest predictor of relapse in both the pediatric and adult uh, ALL setting. Despite this knowledge, uh, the question that uh, is, uh, I'll try to address is that, is there evidence to support that MRD-based risk-directed treatment improves outcomes? In particular, is there evidence that reducing therapy for MRD-negative patients improves outcome? And the, uh, in contrast, uh, is there evidence uh, that escalation or change of therapy for MRD positivity uh, improves uh, outcomes. And I'll try and answer both of these questions in the next slide. So starting with the first question, does reducing therapy for MRD yeah, negative MRD patients negative improve, improve outcomes? Outcome. And uh, quickly, uh, a study that was recently uh, completed and published, uh, which is the Children's Oncology Group 0932 study, which uh, had uh, in its eligibility the NCI standard risk acute lymphoblastic uh, leukemia patient population, and NCI standard risk are those that uh, are one to 10 years of age and have a Y count of less than 50 at the time of diagnosis. The study recruited patients from 2010 to 2016. And among its objectives is addressing the therapy for standard risk low patient populations. And standard risk low uh, was defined as uh, ALL patients, NCI standard risk patients that had favorable cytogenetics defined as the presence of ETV6 RONX1 or the double trisomy positivity of chromosomes uh, 4 and 10 had CNS1 status and had MRD levels at day eight peripheral blood and day 29 bone marrow uh, less than 0.01% as measured by flow cytometry. And two different low risk regimens were tested in this population, the uh, standard COG0331 uh, regimen and the uh, P9904 uh, regimen. The uh, 0331 regimen was labeled as LRC, LRC regimen, and the P9904 was labeled as the LRM regimen. And the LRM regimen uh, was a regimen that had no anthracyclines, no alkylating agents, uh, and had uh, six doses of uh, intermediate or uh, uh, dose uh, methotrexate of one gram per meter square, square without uh, leucovorin uh, rescue. And the study uh, was published recently in uh, 2020 and showed outstanding uh, disease-free survival results with a five-year uh, DFS of approximately 99% uh, using either regimen and a five-year overall survival of 100% using either regimen. However, uh, despite both uh, regimens being well-tolerated, uh, given that anthracycline alkylators and uh, capizi methotrexate with asparaginase was used in the LRC regimen, uh, the uh, rates of mucositis and allergic reactions were higher in that particular regimen, which is the LRC uh, regimen. And this study confirmed that the application of uh, stringent risk criteria that includes MRD at different time points uh, in a favorable risk group uh, results in a almost certain cure with either uh, low risk regimen, uh, allowing you know uh, optimal selection uh, for uh, this uh, particular patient population. 
The question, uh, however, is that can we do better? Does uh, MRD uh, method uh, really make a difference? Uh, is detecting lower levels of uh, minimal residual disease um, a, 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 an important aspect that will allow us to even uh, select uh, patients uh, more precisely? We know that flow cytometry, which was used in the majority of North American uh, studies and clinical trials, uh, was the main method and detects up to one to 10 to the minus four uh, blasts in the, in the marrow. Uh, PCR uh, is used mainly in the European trials. Uh, however, uh, recently we now have the high throughput sequencing or the next generation sequencing, which can detect levels up to 10 to the minus six. And this was a question of uh, uh, a number of recent studies uh, that looked at uh, different methods of uh, MRD detection between NGS and flow cytometry in this particular study. Uh, this study looked at uh, the population of the 0232, which is the NCI high-risk population, and the COG0331, which is the NCI standard risk uh, population, and compared the flow cytometry MRD measurements with the uh, high-throughput sequencing or the next, next generation sequencing using the uh, CloneOSeq um, uh, uh, approved uh, method. Uh, and compared uh, these uh, results in paired samples. And what was found uh, is that uh, there was a high uh, discordant uh, rate uh, between the NGS method and the flow cytometry with the NGS method detecting approximately 39% more patients that are MRD positive at the, the, uh, the time points that were tested. Uh, in addition, uh, patients that had uh, NGS negative MRD uh, uh, were uh, sig uh, significantly uh, better in terms of uh, overall survival in both the standard risk and the high risk cohorts. However, those that had uh, MRD negativity by flow, but uh, MRD positivity by NGS had an intermediate risk survival that was significantly lower than those that were uh, negative by a, a more sensitive technique in detecting uh, MRD. Uh, a pilot study uh, looking at the uh, standard risk population uh, looking at uh, the population that was uh, completely negative by NGS, uh, the, the, by the NGS MRD technique, uh, showed that uh, uh, the 20% of patients that had no detectable residual clonal sequencing by NGS at end of induction uh, had a uh, EFS of 98% and an overall survival of 100%. Uh, compared to those that had uh, any level of NGS detection at end of induction. Uh, and this included patients with and without uh, favorable uh, genetics. Uh, so again, indicating that uh, using a more uh, sensitive uh, method and detecting uh, MRD uh, negativities are at even higher levels uh, does impact outcomes in this particular uh, population. However, uh, I, I did mention initially that I will not talk about uh, Philadelphia positive or other uh, genotypes, uh, but this is just to raise a point, and I'm sure this is mentioned also by uh, the, Dr. Andrea in the uh, original talk, uh, but uh, this, uh, sh this study looked at uh, different methods of MRD detection uh, in the Philadelphia positive ALL, uh, using the uh, flow cytometry technique, the immunoglobulin T cell rearrangement uh, PCR technique, or uh, the BCR ABL1 uh, PCR technique. And in this uh, study that was uh, published in abstract format uh, a number of years back, it showed that despite there's a good uh, concordance between studies, the best uh, concordance rate. Uh, was uh, between the immunoglobulin T cell rearrangement PCR and the flow cytometry with 90% of samples being concordant. Uh, however, 
uh, BCR ABL uh, one PCR was uh, not as reliable as flow as a backup test due to uh, uh, technical uh, issues and variability in results, in particular that uh, results uh, tended to be more positive. And when it came to transplant recommendations, uh, HSCT recommendations uh, were made, could be made in 98% of patients when MRD was measured by flow, 84% when uh, immunoglobulin T cell rearrangement was used, uh, and, but only in 39% uh, when uh, BCR ABL1 uh, was used as the method of uh, MRD testing. And this study concluded that uh, for patients not enrolled on clinical trials, using flow for MRD assessment is perhaps the most practical method in North American centers. And uh, however, NGS uh, was not uh, formally tested, formally tested uh, in, uh, in the Philadelphia ALL population uh, studies in, the, in, this part, in these particular studies. Similarly, the SFAL, the European, uh, have also compared uh, MRD detection in the Philadelphia ALL positive population uh, and compared the immunoglobulin T cell rearrangement PCR method with the BCR ABL1 method. And as shown here, there were higher positivities uh, when uh, the BCR ABL1 method. Uh, was used compared to uh, the uh, immunoglobulin T cell uh, rearranged methods. And although the concordance rate was pretty good at approximately 70%, uh, there's, there tended, uh, we, the study tended to have a significantly higher positivity by the BCR-ABL1 uh, method. And uh, the, this study concluded that uh, when it comes to MRD uh, assessment and measurement uh, in this particular study, the immunoglobulin T cell rearrangement uh, appeared to be more reliable as a method of MRD detection. So despite that uh, uh, the, the BCR-ABL may be more sensitive or specific, uh, when it comes to uh, different genotypes, different methods may be more reliable than others, uh, and the other uh, uh, methods may need further uh, validation and testing. So uh, we've talked about um, uh, MRD uh, uh, dose reduction or uh, regimen reduction in therapy. Uh, for patients that are MRD negative, but how about escalation or change of therapy for those that continue to be MRD positive? And to, a number of studies that uh, have uh, tried to address this particular uh, question, and one of them is the uh, UCAL 2000, 2003 study that uh, randomized uh, patients that uh, had MRD positivity uh, between uh, standard uh, therapy using uh, regimen B versus uh, regimen C that included the BFM augmented backbone in addition to eight doses of PEG aspergenase, uh, 18 doses of uh, vincristine and escalated dose IV methotrexate without folinic acid rescue uh, as additional to the uh, standard uh, regimen B in this particular study. And this study has shown that uh, with uh, chemotherapy intensification for persistent MRD at end of induction, uh, defined as an MRD uh, above or equal to 0.01%, uh, the intensification uh, favored uh, augmentation with uh, uh, a trend of uh, improved outcomes. Uh, however, they did mention that augmentation of treatment was associated with more adverse events than standard uh, post-remission uh, therapy. And this notion of increased toxicity when intensifying chemotherapy for uh, MRD positivity or for uh, high-risk features uh, has also been shown in uh, other studies. So for example, this is the Children's Oncology Group uh, 1131 study that uh, intensified the uh, high-risk backbone by adding, uh, incorporating uh, clofarabine and other uh, chemotherapy intensification methods uh, to patients that had uh, very high-risk features, that, including those that had day 29 MRD positivity of 0.01% or more. This study was uh, uh, closed early 
uh, and uh, that was due to the uh, unacceptable uh, toxicity that was associated with the very high risk uh, uh, regimen that incorporated more uh, chemotherapy. Similarly, uh, from the uh, 0232 study that uh, included NCI high risk patients, patients that had uh, MRD uh, positivity or slow early response received a double delayed intensification and interim maintenance. And although um, this uh, showed that uh, early on uh, the curves for those that received double delayed intensification and interim maintenance were high, at the three-year level, uh, the uh, uh, survival curves for both uh, uh, event-free survival and overall survival uh, uh, crossed. Uh, suggesting and indicating that further intensification of chemotherapy for NCI high-risk patients with positive MRD at end of induction delays but does not prevent uh, relapse. So how about uh, MRD levels at end of consolidation? Uh, can we stratify patients uh, further? Do all patients that are end, end of M induction MRD positive need a change in management? And uh, this uh, study was uh, published uh, back in 2015 by Borowitz et al. Uh, that looked at uh, uh, end of consolidation MRD stratification uh, for patients that were end of induction uh, MRD positive. And based on a cutoff of 0.01%, uh, patients that were MRD negative at end of consolidation had an event-free survival at five years of approximately 79%, which was uh, very reasonable. Uh, despite uh, MRD positivity at end of induction. However, those that had MRD positivity at end of consolidation uh, had a, a very poor uh, five-year event-free survival of uh, 39%. So how about NCI standard risk patients? Do these patients uh, with end of induction, end of consolidation positivity uh, by MRD do as poorly as NCI high-risk patients? And this uh, was a study that was published recently uh, that looked up end of consolidation positivity in the NCI standard risk group. And again, stratified by end of consolidation MRD positivity, the, although there was a significant difference in the four-year disease-free survival uh, between patients that were end of consolidation MRD positive versus negative, uh, the overall survival, the event-free survival, disease for survival is approximately 73% for those that were end of consolidation MRD positive uh, versus 90%, uh, 90.7% 90 for those that were end of consolidation uh, MRD uh, negative. However, uh, despite this uh, significant difference in disease-free survival, the uh, four-year overall survival was above 90% for both uh, disease population. It was not significantly different. Uh, although, the, uh, so these patients were uh, easily salvageable uh, despite uh, the, uh, the significant difference in events. So to summarize uh, the end of induction, end of consolidation, MRD positivity uh, by uh, NCI risk, NCI standard risk patients that are end of induction MRD positive uh, have a, a four-year disease-free survival of 90% when they're end of consolidation MRD negative and 73% uh, when they are end of consolidation MRD positive. However, their overall survival rates exceed 90%. Uh, in contrast, those that are NCI high risk end of induction MRD positive uh, and end of consolidation negative, they have a reasonable disease free survival of approximately 79% and of, uh, at an end of consolidation uh, MRD uh, positive, uh, if they're end of consolidation MRD positive, a uh, disease free survival of 39%. So uh, based on these results, uh, there is uh, really no clear evidence to justify intensifying therapy for the NCI standard risk with end of consolidation MRD positivity uh, uh, beyond the high risk backbone therapy, uh, given the uh, acceptable and reasonable outcome and the uh, overall survival seen in this particular population. 
uh, until the results of the uh, 1731 are, are, are available. And uh, this is the current ongoing COG trials that are really testing uh, whether incorporating uh, immunotherapy for this part, NCI standard risk, high risk, and those with end of consolidation uh, positivity is uh, uh, beneficial. And I'm sure that uh, this will be covered by Dr. Gupta in, this, in the following meet, uh, presentation. So we talked about uh, NCI risk, uh, but how about uh, genotype? Uh, does genotype impact uh, MRD uh, stratification and management? And uh, this is a very interesting study that I uh, enjoyed reading, uh, which uh, was published a number of years back that looked at genotype-specific MRD uh, disease uh, incorporation uh, to see if that can improve risk stratification of pediatric ALL. And allow me to take a minute in presenting this uh, uh, that data. So this uh, figure uh, is from the UCAL 2003 uh, uh, study that included uh, more than 2,500 patients, and it looked at uh, the proportion of patients, uh, as shown here in the density, that are uh, positive or uh, negative at different levels. Uh, in different uh, areas as shown in the uh, height of the curve, and also uh, the risk of relapse as shown in the scale here, that uh, those that had uh, low risk of relapse of approximately 1% in light yellow versus those that have high risk of relapse in dark burgundy as shown here. And when the full population uh, collectively, you see that uh, despite the majority are MRD negative at this particular threshold, uh, the risk of relapse uh, starts really increasing gradually somewhere between 0.01 and 0.1%, but becomes more evident as we get closer to 5% at end of induction. When uh, subgroups are, uh, by uh, genetic subtypes are looked at uh, differently, you find that uh, the, both the height of uh, and proportion of patients at different levels uh, change, but also the color density uh, changes despite the increasing uh, uh, MRD uh, uh, levels uh, in these particular populations. So for ETV6 Runix1, you don't see the burgundy color here. For high hyperdiploidy, you start seeing the uh, darkness in color as we approach 5%. For the intermediate risk, uh, the colors start changing as we uh, increase 0.01%. And for the high risk population, you see that the color uh, starts getting darker even before the 0.01% level. Uh, and when you look at, uh, when they looked at the T-cell ALL phenotype, uh, the, there was uh, quite a, a variability with no dark burgundy seen even at levels, uh, except when you reach levels uh, above 5% or even when you reach levels of 5% or more. So based on this data, they were able to uh, create an integrated risk group of uh, standard risk, intermediate risk, and high risk, incorporating different cytogenetic subgroups as defined below here, and different MRD thresholds with each group uh, that uh, represent different percentages of patients with different risks of relapse and different risk of high risk relapse, uh, showing that eight, only 8% 8 of the population here uh, have a significantly low EFS, higher risk of relapse, lower uh, uh, overall survival, and most of these relapses uh, were, uh, or, or a big uh, proportion of these relapses were high risk relapses in this population. So based on this, uh, they said that although they concluded that although the risk of relapse was directly proportional to the MRD level within each uh, genetic risk group, the absolute risk of relapse that was associated with a specific MRD level varied by genetic subtype and immunophenotype. And just a word about uh, MRD in T cell ALL. Uh, this is a uh, the study from the uh, uh, Italian uh, BFM uh, group uh, 2000 that showed that when you look at uh, time point one, uh, the risk of relapse, uh, if you're positive at time point one, was not significantly uh, different at different levels as long as you were negative at time point two. However, if you were uh, positive at time point two, the uh, level of MRD 
uh, the risk of relapse increases as the level of MRD uh, increases. Uh, and uh, this study concluded that MRD at time point two uh, constitutes the most important predictive factor for uh, relapse in childhood T-cell ALL. So based on this uh, and on the uh, recent consensus uh, statement, uh, timing of uh, uh, intervening and managing uh, MRD uh, really depends on, uh, should depend on a, a specific time point. And the general consensus here is at uh, end of consolidation as indicated by the consensus, international consensus uh, consortium statement. And the new COG definition for treatment failure uh, that is used in the 17, 31 and 32 is a level of 1% or more or residual extramedullary disease. And similar definitions uh, are to be incorporated in uh, other trials uh, by the BFM and other uh, clinical trial groups. So uh, how does uh, the NCCN guideline uh, give um, uh, 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 or pub publish their approach? Uh, as guidance, uh, so patients that MRD positive post-induction, the, the uh, guidance is to put them on a clinical trial. However, if there is no clinical trial to uh, start augmented consolidation uh, chemotherapy, if they become MRD negative, to continue uh, uh, chemotherapy as long as they're end of consolidation MRD negative, and uh, then to continue chemotherapy as the main uh, stay for that particular uh, population. However, if they're MRD positive, then uh, a, a using immunotherapy uh, or uh, uh, is, is a reasonable approach using an approved immunotherapeutic approach as a bridge to transplant is uh, probably the mainstay uh, of therapy for patients not on uh, clinical trials. So in summary, uh, what we know today is that MRD is prognostic. MRD can detect a group of patients that can be treated with low intensity therapy with an almost definite cure. Uh, MRD kinetics uh, vary by leukemia, NCI risk, genetic subtype and immunophenotype, and patients who achieve end of consolidation MRD negativity do relatively well with chemotherapy alone. Uh, however, a small percentage of patients have MRD positivity at end of consolidation and are labeled as end of consolidation failure. And these are extremely unlikely to be cured with standard cytotoxic chemotherapy. And given the low number of and percentages of patients, it will be difficult uh, to um, answer uh, this particular uh, question of the best approach, except with uh, 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 trials uh, uh, that, that incorporate uh, 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 a good number of patients uh, using collaborative clinical uh, trials. And what we don't know today is that uh, would adding immunotherapy to chemotherapy backbone versus transplant or cellular therapy in first remission in patients with persistent MRD positivity uh, would improve outcome. So I would conclude with a suggested approach as of today until we have further information from ongoing trials that decision for MRD-based treatment assignment should be decided post end of consolidation assessment. Patients who achieve end of consolidation MRD negativities, negative status should continue uh, the high-risk chemotherapy backbone. Patients who have end of consolidation MRD uh, levels 1% uh, or above uh, are considered uh, failures and should be considered for immunotherapy versus transplant versus CAR T cell therapy. Patients with end of consolidation MRD levels between 0.01% and 1% should be discussed for best therapy based on the following criteria. Uh, if they're NCI standard risk, the suggestion would to continue interim maintenance using high dose methotrexate and reassess the bone marrow for MRD and continue therapy if negative. If your NCI, if the patient is NCI high risk, then immuno or chemotherapy uh, is probably best versus immunotherapy and transplant uh, versus CAR T uh, cell therapy as an approach. If you're uh, depending on your cytogenetics, if you're favorable or intermediate, then continue on chemotherapy and assess after interim maintenance one. Uh, however, if you're uh, intermediate or unfavorable uh, genetics, then uh, giving immunotherapy and chemotherapy uh, versus immunotherapy as a bridge to transplant or uh, CAR T cell therapy uh, could be a, a, a option for these patients. And these options really de depend on access 
uh, to CAR T cell therapy and availability of a suitable donor. The question uh, is also important if you have access to CAR T cell therapy is what if you would uh, uh, collect uh, patients uh, that are end of induction MRD positive uh, to uh, plan uh, for uh, CAR T cell therapy, and if you sh should plan these patients for bone marrow surveillance at different time points. And with that, I conclude. Uh, thank you very much.